You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 44 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and I am joined by two of my favorite people. So let's start with Mindy. Good mor- Good morning. Hello. Let's say it's morning. Nobody it's not knows. morning. It's Friday afternoon. But nobody. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Completely Friday lost afternoon. my mind. This is going to sound like Friday afternoon. <laughs> and we're also here with Gina Rogers. Welcome to the show, Gina. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. Should we get started? We should. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> News and follow up. News and follow up. So. I will follow up on, we talked about Adobe Spark for Education right. in a recent episode. And Adobe came out with another announcement that um, is kind of related, but it's specifically for schools. They can mm-hmm. have the Creative Cloud suite of apps at $5 per student. So that's Photoshop, Lightroom, Illustrator, um, all those other apps. Audition, yeah. yes. All those expensive professional Adobe apps. Right. Now, I think there's a small caveat. I think you need to have 500, 500. as a minimum right. student licensees. So some schools, they're going to be like, we're not that big. That's yeah. not going to work for us. Right. But if you are able to take advantage of that, your friendly neighborhood Adobe reseller will mm-hmm. hook you up. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. great. And I kind of uh, read the blog post about that. And um, the nice thing about it is that it's Creative Cloud. So students, the blog, are, the blog was kind of talking about how students were kind of tied to the computers at school. And so they weren't able to finish projects because they were tied to that one computer. But now that students be able to log in and use them at home was really life changing for some of them. So yeah, because especially those like those pro pro apps right. need like high power machines, yeah. usually like iMacs or decent PC desktops. So they can uh, use that stuff anywhere now. Yeah. So that's great news. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell me a little bit about Autodesk Sketchbook. Autodesk Sketchbook <laughs> is now free <laughs> on all devices. Um, it's kind of a similar uh, vein, a creative app that mm-hmm. Autodesk have had out for a while. I think definitely on the iPad before it was free with in-app purchases. But um, you can now get it for Mac, PC, iOS... Maybe I think Android? you said all devices, so... Yeah, all of the devices. <laughs> all of them. Oh, all the devices. <laughs> all the devices, yes. Uh, so it's now free for everybody. So, I mean, I've used things like uh, Adobe Draw, which is uh, yep. free, and it's kind of a sketching type of app, but it um, could be a good sketch noting one. It could be good for digital art classes. Mm. We've got a podcast coming up on Arts Ed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that would have been a good one for that one, too. It would have been, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you do any 3D rendering on this? I don't know if you do, but uh, okay, might be worth a look. Yeah, because I was thinking Autodesk is the program that we use for the 3D printer. That's what I thought. And so when I went, yeah. looked at this, I'm like, am I completely lost my mind? I thought Autodesk was like a 3D printing thing, but this is Autodesk Sketchbook. Autodesk does several apps and yeah. software services. So yeah, this is just one of those. Like but, I didn't uh, want to say, no, ex- no idea Sketchbook even existed. <laughs> I was oh, like, oh, I thought this okay. was a tech nugget. No, okay. It's just now free. Great. It could have been a tech nugget, yes. Yeah. Why don't you do some Google updates for us? Okay, Monday? so um, if you haven't noticed and you're a Gmail user, as you know, Jonathan and I have been inbox users forever, and we also have talked about the new Gmail updates. But now Google Drive is also kind of matching the look of the new mm-hmm. Gmail. Yeah, and you and had this today. And I you, still don't have it. But. And you don't, yes. Yeah. So I think it's going to stage rollout. It's going to have just a kind of a more circular button in the top left-hand corner, like the new Gmail button. So mm-hmm. have you checked that new. recently, Gina? Do you have that? Yeah, I don't. But honestly, I haven't like shut down Chrome in 48 <laughs> hours. So <laughs> that could be the... Maybe so I said to him, like, I guess months. if I logged out, maybe, maybe I'd have it. Maybe. Not today. <laughs> if that's I refresh really my browser every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I have a thousand tabs open and that's my to-do list. And they're not going anywhere. So. Yeah, I got quite a few open right now, too. Mm-hmm. Shocker. All right. So also... I don't know much, that, and once again, not much of a Gmail user anymore, but now offline Gmail and Chrome? Yeah, you used to have to get <clears> like <throat> an offline app, I think, mm-hmm. for Gmail. Right, But yeah. now um, it is off by default. Your Just, Google administrator can turn it on in the dashboard, right. and then you go into your settings inside of Gmail, and you can just toggle a button that says enable offline Gmail, mm-hmm. and then you can just use 
Is that the web on any browser then, or only, only on Chrome? Chrome? Correct, only okay. on Chrome. Version something and higher. Hmm. 50, something and higher. <laughs> yes. No, that sounded technical. Fifty-seven <laughs> six in my head, but that might just be a random number I pulled 50, out of the air. Thirty-five oh two. Sure, let's go yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I happened to come across this last night and thought I was losing my mind because I thought, is this something that has always existed and I didn't know? But then you had it on a news and follow up, and I thought, oh, it really was new. Is the ability to insert your slides from Google Slides into a Google Doc, which? Um, as you two can see on the show notes, I gave it a try. So I um, inserted one slide. And as I may have mentioned before, I'm not a huge fan of Google Drawings. I know everyone just, it's okay. I'm not a fan of Google Drawings. However, I love to do that kind of stuff in slides. And so I really think this is a nice way because you get all your illustrating, drawing, arty things inside slides and then can import that slide into your Google Doc. It was super simple, too. Just copy, paste. So I haven't done nice. it yet. So you yeah. just choose the presentation, then it says yep. choose the slide? Yeah, so, so you just Kindle? highlight the slide, Yeah. you copy it, you okay. go into your doc, so and I'm you guessing paste. It's- <laughs> that was so it. So you just like right-click copy, yes. right-click yes. paste? that was it. So like I've been having this issue lately. I wonder if it was because this was updating or something, oh. where I've been trying to do... Um... Something to do with work, or yeah, can no. you finish that sentence, Gina? <laughs> I could just cut this bit out. And yeah, go on. You just go with I that. was thinking. I was like, oh, wait a second. Wait, no. I should That's say that. That's something my... personal. No, <laughs> if I was lost my train of thought, and it was something completely different. It's when I've been doing the Shift Command Control click or shift command control four on a mac okay. lets you do a screenshot Shot. but it copies or it clips it to your, to your clipboard, clipboard so it doesn't go to your desktop yes but lately when i've been trying to do that and oh, then paste them into the my one day. slide deck yes. i was like what is going on this is taking forever like why yeah. can't why is this not working and mm-hmm. so i but then i thought wait a second that's not what we were talking about. That wasn't the issue. So, <laughs> thanks, Gina. Never mind. Yeah, okay. There. You can add that bit to the end. <laughs> Comic relief. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, yeah, I thought it was really nice, and I thought it'd be a nice addition to you know if kids are creating things and want to add a drawing or something they've created inside there, um, and they're not Google Drawing fans like myself. That this is a great alternative to that. Yes, it is. I like it a lot. All right. So also. Mm-hmm. We're gonna are we are we gonna say the name again that you say all the time? Richard Byrne? Yeah. <laughs> it's not so much Richard Byrne, but uh it, it's a Google thing that Richard Byrne kinda of broke down. Yeah, right. And he went through Google's uh, six new inverted commas uh right. changes to Google Forms mm-hmm. for teachers. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if we do we want to go through all six of them and see here. I don't know. How about what's your favorite one? There's the automatically grade grid questions, mm-hmm. autocomplete answers, yep, decimal grades, mm-hmm. video feedback. Oh, I like video feedback. You could do video feedback before yeah. though. So um, but like in the in the feedback answers on a quiz, you can put a video. I there. know, but you could before. I think really, I think you could. Well, Richard, you could add a link. Richard said know. you've been able to do this for a while, but now it's Boom. easier to include a YouTube video and answer feedback. Yeah, I think now so there's a feedback, specific button specific there. Thing for there's a specific yes. button YouTube. there for yes. YouTube. Yeah, I agree. That's what the GIF is showing oh, right okay. now. Mm-hmm. Okay. The one thing that I like, and this I thought was a really great update to Google Forms anyway, when it first happened was um, kind of that AI feature where it was analyzing what your question was. And then, like, kind of defaulting first to what the best kind of question. What type of question, yeah. And then probably, um, because I think it even did a, I think it even did something like, didn't it still recommend, like, your name? I don't know. I felt like there were still some recommendations in there that it kind of made. But now what it's doing is really analyzing your question and then giving you answer choices that you can choose from. So it's already trying to figure out what the correct answer to the question is. I think it started (laughs) off with things like yes, no, maybe. But now it's like, which day of the week would be best for you? And it's like, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then add all. And you can just add them all and it populates it straight for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, though. Should you be asking questions in a quiz that are things like, what is the capital of Denmark? Ooh. Let's talk about that later. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying, like, that's yes. the example that I see. And I agree. So I'm yep. just wondering if that's I agree. the highest leverage. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about it now. So. 
So served to you piping hot today is our main course, which is cheating every day. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of a different topic for us because normally we're, we talk well, a lot of tools and how to use tools, but this one is a little bit more philosophical, maybe. I think it'll be a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. So um, just today, I came or was reading a little bit out of Rewiring Education, which is a book by John Couch. And he has this really interesting um, quote in the beginning of his book. So it was a conversation between him and Steve Jobs. And so Steve Jobs had shared this research study from a magazine called Scientific American. And it had um, a study about which animal uses the least amount of energy um, given over a given distance of. um, And so they were taking these different animals and the condor one. And so Steve said, humans didn't do as well. We're about a third of the way down the list. And the twist is, is that the test was run again, but this time um, humans were placed on a bicycle and they compared the condor and the human and um, how efficient would a, would a human be if they covered that same distance, but they were riding a bicycle. So Steve got really excited because he says the man on the bicycle blew the condor away. And that's what the personal computer can be, can be a mental bicycle for humans. And it's the most remarkable tool in all of history. Hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because in our jobs, we always talk about working smarter, not harder, Mm -hmm. right? And using technology in ways that, I don't know, make us more efficient. Yeah, it makes us more efficient. And then, I don't know, allows us the freedom to place the cognitive load in places where it needs to be. Right. Like to, Mm -hmm. to work harder, to think deeper. Right. About the higher leverage type of a task. Mm -hmm. Instead of the tedious stuff Mm -hmm. that takes up your time every day. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of interesting because we talked about all the great tools that technology has to offer. Like the other day I wrote a blog post and I used voice typing, which I had never used voice typing to that capacity before where I sat and just talked. Um, And that was really interesting to me. And I thought, what a great tool. And it was much easier for me to get my thoughts out because I wasn't constantly rereading and correcting as I was going. I was just talking. And then at the end, I went back and um, corrected anything that needed to be corrected. And I thought, this is a great tool for everyone um, because there's so much involved in typing and writing your thoughts at the same time that Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, it's kind of like cheating. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> all that, all well. those typing courses I took, <laughs> which are really great. I'm a great typer, but um, typing in the past has really slowed me down. You know, I didn't realize it until I was yeah. just typing. Yeah, because you're doing two things simultaneously. Right. You're you're doing the typing task, but then you're also trying to generate, you know, the thoughts or yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah. And so, like, you then were able to, I guess, place your cognitive demand on just generating the right. thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a similar experience, but not like it wasn't writing a blog post. It was Mm -hmm. actually last week I was making last weekend. I was making banana muffins. Okay. As one does on Saturdays. (laughs) Not on my Saturday, but okay. (laughs) Anyway. Um, so the recipe calls for three bananas. Yeah. Um, and I had two super ripe bananas, not three. Okay. And I was like, well, you know, one of my, my family members wasn't home and I thought, well, we could get by with with not as many banana muffins. Mm-hmm. However, I then had to do all the oh, math conversion. Oh, of no. conversion, yeah. you know, and there was some like legit, like hard conversions for me for me to do on my, and I was a language arts teacher, yeah. as you guys know, so that's <laughs> not my wheelhouse. And so like, you know, it calls for like three fourths of a cup of yeah. flour. And so yeah. then I had to like, you know, do the ratios of, mm-hmm. you know, so what would that be like? two thirds of three fourths and da da. Yeah. And so finally I kind of worked out the ratios, but then I just ask, um, Alexa yeah. <laughs> what, the, <laughs> what the answers were, yeah. you know, cause I mean, my hands were all messy, messy. and everything. I was like, yeah, because I, it's I, smarter, it right? Like, like, and it's easier. just makes a lot more sense. <laughs> like I just had to make sure that I kind of wrote down my ingredients, what my conversion sure. would have been. And then like yeah. had her do the, the math for yep. me. Yeah, because was, it made sense. Yeah. I was telling Mindy the same thing. Like, um, my daughter, when if she gets stuck on a spelling word, her default now is not to go and grab a dictionary, although I don't know where our dictionary <laughs> is, to be honest, but yeah. is to ask Alexa what the spelling is or ask Siri what, what the spelling is. Mm-hmm. And it reminded me of, like, you know, the time where everybody 
got rid of all their Britannica encyclopedias and took them mm -hmm. off the shelves because they were like all obviously so outdated that the yeah. internet is so much more up to date. Mm -hmm. You know, are we getting to the stage where we don't need dictionaries anymore because yeah. we can find the answer so much mm -hmm. more quickly? Yeah. And, you know, you were saying the other day, how, how do you find a word in the dictionary that you don't know how to spell? I, yeah. I mean, that's the craziest thing that we have asked yeah. kids to do for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Find <laughs> the word phone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like kids. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to time you. Find the word <laughs> chaos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of um, brings us back to education, too. And, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, what kind of tasks are we asking our students to do? Because then we talked about the spelling thing. And mm -hmm. I said, but it's still important for kids to know how to spell important words yeah. because they are going to have to eventually handwrite a note. And, yeah. you know, how do we find that balance between, you know, the things that they really should know to be successful humans and what things they can kind of rely on technology for to help them? you know, function yeah. as adults. Because I use, I mean, I use my computer all the time to figure out how to spell words or whatever, or mm -hmm. synonyms and antonyms and things like that that I um, obviously w was drilled into me as a kid, but I still, it's, I don't need to waste my brain power on that when I can just look it up. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think know. it's that you you said to help you do that sort of thing, not yeah. necessarily to replace your inbuilt knowledge right. of yeah. spelling, yeah. but just to help, you know, when you get stuck on certain things mm -hmm. or you have to do those conversions or you right. can't remember the capital city of, of whatever, then, mm -hmm. you know, these are things that are really easy, quick wins when you use technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And I mean, what is the what is the purpose? What's the outcome? What are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. Like in the end, I was trying to make eight banana muffins out of my th yeah. two bananas. Right. Yeah. You know, right. I wasn't necessarily trying to do math. Mm -hmm. And so that was what I needed to do. That was my my outcome that right. I was trying to reach. Yeah. Um, and so like going back to your example with spelling, um, especially at the younger grades, it, I, I think there is some some importance in I think there's a, actually a pretty good amount of research that's out there about like that that's really important aspect yeah. to of yep. literacy mm -hmm. um, that orthographic and uh, I can't think of all the other technical yeah, right. terms yeah. for that's it okay, right Gina. now that's but, okay <laughs> um, the mapping that goes along with it yeah. anyway so. But I think then it kind of brings us to, like you said, is, you know, what are we asking our students to do? And um, coming up this summer, we have a four C's summer camp um, that will kind of revolve around those four C's. And just a reminder, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and communication. Collaboration. Collaboration. Thank you. Did I say communication twice? You did. <laughs> uh -huh. Thanks, Gina. Um, mm -hmm. But I think those four things are so important for us to be um, using in our classrooms because those really are the important, important life skills that I think you need to have success in mm -hmm. and be capable of um, being engaged in, in your everyday work. I mean, mm -hmm. we do those things together every mm -hmm. single day and I can't, I can't cheat. I'm using your quotes, cheat those things. I have to be able to collaborate with you and understand your personality because I collaborate differently with Gina than I do with Jonathan. Because you two are totally it's a lot different more fun people. with me. I'm just telling you guys, <laughs> but it is. It's about learning how to communicate and collaborate. You know, and those are important life skills. And unless we're giving our students the opportunities to do those things in class, you know, when you get out into the real world, you yeah. struggle. You know? Yeah, but I, yeah. but at the same time, I think it's also, um, you know, when when we're teaching to be aware of the digital technologies and things yeah. that are available to us and not to like ignore the fact that kids can go and Google the answer to right. something, right? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, to ignore that fact is to, I don't know, having the, the blindfold on basically yeah. that in, there are things out there that when kids are outside of your classroom or outside of whatever it is you're constructing for them that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have access to all these tools and we use them on a daily basis. Yeah, so, right. you know, they're going to use them as well. We don't want to teach analog ways in a digital world. Yeah, right. Well, and if students can, you know, Google the answer to the question, I, I don't know, I'm going to throw this out there. Is it a question that's worth like testing our students on if it's something that they can just pull up on their phone and know in a matter of moments. Um, I don't know. I think it's it's something that we really need to consider as we're, you know, kind of reexamining how we're working with our students in the classroom. Yeah. When we had uh, Jeff Utecht here at, uh, at Grant Wood, 
Um, one of the things he, he showed us that stuck in my mind for that was um, a Google a day. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that website? No. Uh-uh. So it's it's kind of like a, a internet kind of scavenger hunt type of thing, but they create they craft questions in such a way that you couldn't just paste the question into Google and find the answer. Oh. You need to know, it's like a multi-step process. Uh-huh. You need to know who this person's brother is in order to know what year they were born, in order to find out which country it's they were like from a or something. Yeah. Right. It, <laughs> it sounds like a breakout, It's right? a multi-step thing. So yeah. if you're thinking about, you know, how can I craft questions in a way that you know, cannot be Googled, Mm -hmm. then you could look at that website for examples or, you know, just thinking about getting kids to apply knowledge in terms of things instead of asking them what four times seven is. You say, well, you know, think about ways that they can apply apply the math in like reward situations Mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. I I don't know, to go along with what you were saying about applying knowledge too, I think having like a strong grasp um, as a teacher of like different levels of questioning too is mm-hmm. really important. Sure. And so, and that's, we're, I don't think that any of us are saying that there is absolutely no place for recall type right. of questions. Right. Absolutely. You know, like mm-hmm. if I go back to the banana muffin yeah. example, because I'm going to ride this metaphor into the sun site. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, of course, at one point in time, like it, it was really appropriate for me to be doing cra- or conversions of fractions, sure. um, even though that was like more algorithmic yeah. um, and not necessarily a higher order type of thinking skill. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it makes sense to have a, a good understanding of different levels of thinking sure. and knowing when to use those and knowing like also having a real good understanding of your standards and what the standard is asking mm-hmm. at different levels of um, like depth of knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. So Mindy put an interesting article in the show notes that I thought I'd pull a couple of things out of, and it's from the Atlantic, and uh, it's entitled "I Cheated All Through High School," <laughs> and I was wondering what this was going to be about. But you know, some interesting things in here from their um, report. They noticed that sixty to seventy percent of high school students report that they have cheated. Ninety percent of students admit to having copied another student's homework. Mm. So there's lots of cheating out there. And I guess Mm -hmm. there's been cheating before technology and there's cheating now that we have technology. And if there's anything after technology, then there's probably still going to be cheating at school. So I don't know. Any thoughts on why that those numbers are so high? Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but I cheated my way through high school chemistry. And I am, I mean, total transparency. I, um... I never answered a question on a quiz that I hadn't gotten from somewhere else, and not that I'm proud of it, but I would say the reason I did it is because I didn't understand the concept of anything that we were talking about, um, and instead of Google, I had Mark Hageman. Thanks, Mark Hageman. Shout out to Mark Hageman out there. But um, I just sat next to him in the hallway and copied all of my homework down. Hmm. You know what I mean? So Yeah. Um, and, and that's because I could get away with it, right? All yeah. I needed was the correct answer to get myself through it. And right. that was it. So you're playing the game of school. I played the game of school really yeah. well right. through my whole whole career. Whole career. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and, you know, it's it's just the truth. I, you know, yeah. so, I take mean, my diploma away. <laughs> I'm going to take it away. Mindy, <laughs> going back to... Where did, do you go back go, to gram, gram Mound oh, or so <laughs> DeWitt, uh, yeah. wherever oh, that was that you... Yeah. Yeah, but I I think that's it. You know, I never needed to answer anything besides knowing what the formulas were, and those were easy to come by. Math, I know, yeah. and, I, and I think even as 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 adults, we still cheat in vertical yeah. commas. I'm using your air quotes here. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about you know some of the online classes I've done. Yeah. And maybe it's not. Hmm. It's not going to be. It's going to be cheating per se. But this right. is going to be looking for shortcuts. And the easy way out of doing things. And I think kids do the same way. Like, uh, you know, you you always get like a busy week at either at home or at work and you've got no time to do stuff. So yeah. you have a quick scan through what the assignments are. And the assignment says, hey, read this thing by Daniel Pink and write a reflection. Yeah. You know, if you went through every single page, you'd have to read like 12 different things. But the, really the only one I need to read in order to go to the assignment to get the grade is that one Daniel Pink thing. So mm-hmm. that's all I did. And yeah. we, we've probably all been there and done things like that in yep. online classes sometimes. I'm not going to say I did that every week because that's not true. I mean, I 
do these things to to learn and get better at whatever it is mm -hmm. I want to study. But there's going to be times where we get squeezed and run out of time. And I think we have talked to a little bit about, you know, students have to have a purpose for the learning, right? And if they feel like they can squeak by, they will. Smarter, not harder, right? So, yeah. uh -huh. um, you know, and for them to have some sort of voice in their learning and have a purpose for it and to see the reason I'm doing this is for this end game here or this is the goal I'm working towards, uh, I think is really important and hopefully minimizes some of that, you know, cheating yeah. that so students was, might do i was wondering in your example with chemistry like it how wasn't much, an example okay <laughs> <laughs> i was wondering in that true life example yeah true, right real world example real world um so to what level did you feel like there was like formative like no stakes type of feedback um on how you were doing and understanding because you said that you felt like you didn't understand those concepts did, right mm -hmm. and so like part of me is just wondering if this goes back to just, you know, what sort of feedback were you getting as a student right. before you were, like, required to turn something in for, like, a grade right? that let you know, hey, I don't understand this very right. well. Mm -hmm. I need to go access, you know, my teacher. I need to access these resources. I need to go learn yeah, this and there better. wasn't any of that right yeah no, i mean there there just wasn't and that's what i think is so great about education today is that we're seeing teachers kind of empowering students to say hey i don't understand this where can i go or what resources do you have for me where at the time when i was in high school you know i would have had to go in during study hall in lounge time you know no lost my ability to have a mountain dew nobody's <laughs> giving up lounge time um, to get extra help. And even then, who knows if, you know, that teacher would have had a free period or whatever. But yeah, there was no feedback at that time. I don't think maybe that was something yeah. I that mean, things was have being changed. done. Things have changed tremendously. Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and then I also, like, that kind of led me to thinking, I was making a connection too between what you were saying about online courses. And mm -hmm. like, I, I always struggle with this, like having done online course, like been a participant in online courses and then also been a facilitator in online courses, right. how to structure effective formative assessment, mm -hmm. formative feedback yeah. in online courses. Yeah. Like I, as a participant, I don't necessarily feel like I, I get like good um formative type of feedback right. all the yeah. time mm -hmm. um and i know that as a facilitator it's true that i don't give it yeah right um, yeah and i don't know if we kind of rely yeah. on uh, participants to get that via online discussions yeah and if they're getting that i mean I there's a, you know that's a long long you know topic for discussion yeah, that's a whole different podcast whole different right podcast. is using an lms effectively go. yep Episode 45. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it's about meaning and purpose, though, as well. That, yeah. you know, you as the student need to see the meaning and purpose of, of doing some of this stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's about having a, a classroom culture as yeah. well. Yeah. Where you're, you're setting a culture that your, your kids know that the work you're doing is, is meaningful and something that they should be engaged in because it reminds me of, you know, one of the blended learning breakouts we had. And I can't remember where this teacher was from, but if I could, I would absolutely give her props for it. But we were having this discussion over um, station rotation groups mm -hmm. and how one teacher was saying, I find it really hard to get my kids to do this work because they always say, will it be graded? And no, it's not always going to go straight in the grade book. And so the other teacher said, well, I have, we, I have this you know relationship with my kids where I say, I won't give you anything that isn't meant to enhance and make your learning better. And the kids know that, and I know that, and we hold each other accountable for that. And I'm like, that just blows my mind. And so how could you fail to, you know, want to do your best and be motivated in a classroom like that, where, you know, you have that culture where, you know, everything is given to you is for your own benefit. It's not busy work. It's not right. stuff just to keep you quiet while I'm working with a group over here. Yeah. And and so. that's not easy either. No, it's that. not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. absolutely. Doesn't just happen overnight, that's yeah. for certain. Yeah. So if we 
round this discussion back over to technology mm-hmm. and how technology, because we got kind of philosophical there. For yeah, a we did. While. Got real deep, real we quick. We got real deep, real <laughs> quick. Um, so bring it back. Well, I don't think that this is necessarily going any less deep, but bringing it back around to maybe more of the traditional focus of what you guys talk about mm-hmm. on a weekly basis and talking about uh, tech tools right. and how tech tools help us um, or help students. So what do you think about, um, for example, like a reading task Mm -hmm. that a student has to do at the ninth grade level and they have a serious time or serious problem, difficulty with decoding text. And so they utilize screen reader to, to help support them in that endeavor. Not cheating. Not cheating. Not cheating. Not unfair. Not unfair. Yeah. Why? Um, because I think it's important that, um, you know, students can access material that their classmates are accessing regardless of what their abilities are. Um, and I often think, and not that I've heard this from people, but I think that a screen reader is, can be good for everyone, right? So it's not just about the student that really has a disability. It's very much for them. Yes. Um, but for anyone that might get distracted easily, we've also talked about how online reading is a more difficult task than say reading a book or off of a piece of paper that that can be, um, that, what do you read? You read like in a T or something, right? You and I, Mm -hmm. Gina and I have talked about that before. F pattern reading. F pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so even knowing those things that, you know, screen readers are great for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. They can definitely help, um, counter yeah, and that, that I think comes back to culture as well because you need to help educate some of the students in your class because sure. there's going to be other kids that will think, hey, that's unfair, they get to yeah. use this and I don't. And maybe it shouldn't be a case of they do and you don't because, like you mm-hmm. said, ev- it should be something that could be available to everybody yeah. to access as opposed to just certain students. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, it goes back to some of the stuff we're doing on AIM and accessible materials and mm-hmm. giving people text and materials and formats that best suit their learning yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i think also too like what is the what's the purpose for the reading and like what are you assessing Mm -hmm. um and in the ninth grade you know in the example that i gave um you're not going to see decoding being assessed you know is going to be comprehension type of tasks and so it's like their ability to find um, or find the way that a character changes over time right. or to pick out theme mm-hmm. in the text or yeah. something like that. Right. Um, and so I think that, you know, the questions that you're asking are more aligned with that comprehension type of task. You're not asking them to decode. And so you can't like hold their hands behind their back. Right. And stop them Mm -hmm. from, you know, doing that comprehension level task because they don't have the appropriate tool. It's kind of like you wouldn't ask a kid who couldn't see without their glasses to read this text and then, you know, (laughs) comprehend it. Yeah. I heard, um, you know, during our, we had a um, meeting here at the agency yesterday with lots of different, you know, people who work at Grantwood AA. And I heard one of our AT people say something like, um, you know, they that student put the book down because it was too hard for them to read, but it was like a classroom text that everyone was planning on reading. And so um, she said something like, so having that book read to them would allow them to engage in conversations with their peers. You know, if, mm-hmm. we, if they just put it down because it was too hard for them, they miss out on those conversations and building relationships with their peers because, you know, they're just like out of the game, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah. and I thought that was a really good point. So. Yeah, definitely, I mean, can contribute to how they identify or don't identify themselves as a reader Mm -hmm. um, when they can't access that text. And reading is a really social um, experience. It really is, yeah, it really is. Okay, assistive technology, not cheating. Uh, (laughs) 
here's Check. here's yeah. one I'm gonna I'm curious as to what you think about this. And so there's another there's a couple of apps and sort of websites, things like Photomath mm. and SciMath dot com, where you can take a picture of a math problem or type it into a search field, and it will solve the math problem for you, giving you all the steps along the way, cheating or not cheating. Uh, that one is so hard for me because that one's like hard for me too. I. <sighs> To go back to the banana muffin. Oh boy, one. we're still going with that. <laughs> just hammer no, it home, it was Gina. Just, you know, it it was important for me to know like fractions and kind of think about equivalent fractions and those types of things, yes. you know, and have some basic understanding right. Right. of right. that, yep. you know. Right. Um, and so like I feel like, and I don't, I'm not a math teacher. I don't have expertise in math, but it. It feels like to me that there there is um, some level of like basic level type of math that you kind of do to get like fluent mm-hmm. at the, the the lower level mm-hmm. concepts, yeah. yeah, you know, um, that preps you to do some of the higher level right type of mm-hmm. thinking, sure, you know, yeah, um, and so and so that you know, like I don't think you can throw kids like higher level thinking tasks right out of the gate mm-hmm. with regards to math. Right. Um without prepping them with some of that mm-hmm. lower level fluency understanding. Yeah. Um and so like that's why this one is so hard for me. Yeah. Because like I feel like that part of it is important. Right. Um, I guess I guess what I was thinking was it's gonna be context. Right. Like it's going to be when you're using that type of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not going to use it maybe on an end of chapter test because it's just going to be if you're doing those right wrong answers that you know are just right there on the page, then that's going to give you that right wrong answer. But I think about you know you've seen these like uh, worksheets that kids get where there's a QR code in the corner where you can check your answer by scanning the QR code. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, got the answer right there on the quiz. And, you know, maybe it's used in that kind of scenario where you're you're checking answers or, you know, where you just get stuck. And then, you know, at least it does not just give you the answer. It does give you the step by step of how to solve this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The maybe the context of how it's used and where it's used. You yeah, know, could depend on whether it's cheating or not cheating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like you have to give kids like a, a lot of opportunity, like in class, to get really comfortable with some right. of those lower level things, and then give them maybe something that's a little upper level or hi- higher higher level thinking to stew over, like mm-hmm. you know, as an assignment at night, and sure. then like come back to it the next day. I think it takes some creativity and thinking about the way that we we teach math. And like not necessarily just flipping the page and now we're on to 15.1, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 15.2, 15.3. But like how, what are the learning targets and mm-hmm. how are we delivering the instruction around that? Mm-hmm. You have more of a math pedagogy. I like, do. I like math a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lens. So. Yeah. I, I think um, where I see, and I don't know photo math specifically. I think I know what it does though. Um, what I think about something like that is that if students know already how to arrive at the problem and know the strategies of how to solve a problem, um, I think that's what the most important thing is. So when I look at something like photo math, which gives you the right answer, I think that's great. Whatever. Mm-hmm. So you could check your work. I think it's it's I I like the fact that it'll show you step by step of how they came um, to that answer and kind of show you the different um, strategies to get there. But I think with math, the most important thing to me always was that students had some things in their toolbox toolbox of how to solve the problem, kind of like you did with your banana muffin analogy, right? <laughs> so you had a good idea that you needed to make you know you had less muffins so or less bananas so you had to make less muffins and knowing that you had to then convert cups to maybe a half cup and then I mean that's what's the most important thing I think with math once again not a math consultant but um, 
that's what I think is is important. And then if you need to check your answer, you do that with a calculator, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is like a 21st century version <laughs> yeah, of an of argument they were having 20th century. When yeah. calculators first came out, it's yeah. like, oh, we can't have those in school because yeah, kids don't cheating. know all the answers to everything. And right. then so, but somehow yeah. we managed to work it in how to use calculators properly. Yeah. So maybe right. it's a similar solution for this. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's about knowing the function, right? You oh, need to know how to come a little up. math pun there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so up next, my favorite part of the show is tech nuggets. Nuggety. We going first? Um. Okay, I'll go first. So um, the first thing I had on the Tech Nuggets was, uh, and I had already mentioned it early in the show, is that DLG WAA is holding a 4C summer camp. It is from July 24th to July 26th. We are um, going to be doing lots of work around uh, the 4Cs and Bob Dylan, Dr. Robert Dylan, I should say is coming on day three to kind of share with us um, about his book, The Space, which if you haven't looked at the book. Mr. Tambourine Man. Nah, Mr. Tambourine Man. Although maybe he'll sing for us. I don't know. Um, So we're really excited about that. So if you're interested, maybe we can link that into our show notes too. Just a link. We'd love to see you there. And I'm going to just kind of do some different stuff. So that was my first tech nugget. But my second tech nugget, 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 nugget is the um and i sent this out and i'm just wondering is this a new thing or not these um ted lessons they're not new which is fine but they were new to me so they're probably new to someone else out there so i was looking for i don't know i was working on something for the 4c summer camp i think and came across these um ted ed lessons which i thought were really great i'd never seen them before um never come up in any of the pds i'd ever sat in, had no idea that they even existed, but they are different lessons that use um, video and are um, things you can use in your classroom. There's a couple of things you could use with your teachers if you're an administrator um, and other things too. It's kind of a wide range of things. So that's at ed.ted.com backslash lessons. I thought it was really neat. I liked it a lot. Some good stuff there. Yeah. Um, I was out uh, visiting one of our teaching librarians in Olin, Amy Dolly who um, showed me something I thought I would share with you guys too. It is called youcandothecube.com. Now, I know you're thinking it sounds like the latest dance craze, doesn't it? But um, really what it is to do with is the Rubik's Cube um, because there is an education program for the Rubik's Cube that is designed to teach STEM and STEAM standards and 21st century skills. It's aligned to things like uh, NCTM and uh, NGSS. And so they got this whole program for, for educators on solving the Rubik's Cube. And she says, it's amazing. You know, there's an algorithm and a special way that you're supposed to do this. And they have different types of cubes. They have even things like two by two cubes. Uh, as opposed to the traditional three by three cubes. And so they have things like you even have a cube lending program where you can l- borrow some cubes for your classroom to um, do some of these materials and work students through some of these lessons. And they will send you that stuff for free. All you have to do is uh, pay for return shipping. Hmm. So I thought that was pretty neat. It had some nice resources here. If you're interested in teaching something different, problem solving, critical thinking, maybe you want to try it with a, an ELP group or a, you know something like that, then... Mm-hmm. Definitely worth a look. So you can do the cube.com and then click on the educators tab and see all that stuff there. All right. So this, um, my next tech nugget kind of like hit the world by storm today, although I don't know much about it. And that's the Google tour creator. Mm-hmm. Gene and I had done some work with tour, tour builder, builder um, in the past. And so what's interesting about tour creator, is that right? Tour Creator, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've got Tour Builder in my head. Um, with Tour Creator is that you can create virtual reality for your Google Cardboard Viewer mm-hmm. with 360 images, and you can embed it on your website, blog, social media, um, things like that. Share it with a link. No extra apps required. 
You don't have to download it, from what I understand. It's all kind of out there, but not something we can access yet. Would you agree? Like, it has, isn't it a domain thing of sorts? Yeah, it is something. What do you guys know about this? Well, because yesterday, didn't we talk a little bit about that um, with our maps and our domain or something that needs to has to be turned on right be turned on but i don't know that it's necessarily out for domains yet i think it's coming okay at least that's what i saw two days ago when i first saw or maybe it was just yesterday i saw something about it because chad kafka had put something out about it and he said it wasn't in education domains yet but that it was coming yeah it looks like it's based off um street view imagery is that right is yeah, that I where they're building so. all that stuff I think from so you can build your own tour at any time. So I was just wondering, can you upload your own content? Well, so when you look at the creator tools in there, it's Poly and Tilt Brush and Blocks as well. Mm-hmm. So it's maybe going to be like a mixed media of sorts. Could be. So I, like I have said, I don't know a ton about it because they just kind of revealed it yesterday, the day before. Maybe it's been around a little bit longer than that, but I first heard about it in the last couple of days. But maybe it's definitely something to kind of keep your eye on and see what comes out of that yet. So you're going to tell us more and use and follow up I'll in a future try. episode? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I got something here. In fact, the last two things on the list here, one for me, one for Gina. Do you want to go first? Uh, as far as the 3D printers Oh, go? boy. Let's do it. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. So... Iowa City, the ELP teachers, Iowa City Community Schools, the ELP teachers at the elementary each just got a 3D printer Mm -hmm. for their classrooms. Right. Um, So they um, generously let me use their Dremel 3D printer for the past few months to prep Mm -hmm. for um, some learning that we did together last week. And I was... I'm so in love with the Dremel 3D printer. <laughs> I can't even. You can't stop talking about it. I can't it. stop talking like, about it. So, like, right. I did. I was always really scared of our maker bot. Like, yeah, I was like, I like eh, I'm not going to do this. Right. Like, so I never really invested a lot of time mm-hmm. in learning that. But the Dremel, it was just so easy. It was so easy to level the build plate. Right. It's so easy to, like, just fill in the filament or to thread the filament Mm -hmm. and all that so it's so what are you using to create so we were using um tinkercad Mm -hmm. to create the one thing that is not my favorite about the dremel is that it doesn't um accept just as is stl files for creation and so like you just you download another piece of software which is like an autodesk type of software i believe Uh um and upload the file into that and it just converts it to the dremel specific file Mm. type and fixes any little flaws that might be in there converter it's just like a converter type thing yep got it and then push the file over to the printer and there's a cloud print um aspect that's with it as well Hmm. and so like you can send your files like directly from your computer to the to the dremel just on wi-fi nice and so it's, it is really a nice 3D printer. And so it made me really happy. I started making a lot of printed jewelry and things like that. <laughs> if anyone wants some swag, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> <laughs> some you, DLGWA, like, yeah, bling. Just start like printing a big old chain or big something. chain, yeah, sure. some rings, mm-hmm. things awesome. like that. We need some EdTech takeout swag, yeah, don't we? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Print some of that out. Okay. Be like a sweatshop. So it's the yeah. Dremel 3D printer, and we could put a link to that in the show notes if people are interested. You think mm-hmm. this is this is, this is, is it as far as 3D printers go? Is this well, the bee's I just knees? think it, it was so easy to use. It was so stinking easy to use. So That's what's important with the 3D printer, I think. Oh, my gosh. You need it to be yeah. easy. Especially with, like, if you're using it with littles or mm-hmm. younger kids, you know, at the elementary level. Yeah. Um, and as a teacher, like you don't have a lot of time to be no, like monkeying with, with it, that trying to fix it, and build right. plate, and monkeying and with the build plate, everything, leveling the build plate, leveling oh. the build plate. Yeah. So I I thought it was it was really nice my experience with it. So anyway, um, thanks to Iowa City for letting me yeah. borrow it. <laughs> and has it been returned? Dremel, that's the big question. It was either. returned, and Dremel got another. Um, sale Another, out of it because yeah, we right. bought one. We <laughs> one. The team bought one, right? Yes, we did. We want swag from Dremel t-shirts, please. 
Thank you. All right, last tech nugget then. Um, I don't think we talked about this on the podcast, but Mindy and Amber and I mm-hmm. went up to visit our friend Brian Unruh, mm-hmm. and uh, he's been checking out the HTC Vive yeah. and doing some VR stuff in their school in, in Waterloo. Yep. And so that's something we're constantly thinking about and exploring and looking for ways that we could maybe see the potential of that for schools. And we were kind of blown away by some of the stuff we saw. But um, at the same time, we're like, I don't know how we're going to make this work. So Facebook just had their recent developer conference. And as part of that, they released something called the Oculus Go, Mm -hmm. which is a $200 VR headset. Um, but the difference with this one compared to like the Oculus and the, uh, and the HTC Vive is that um, it's wireless. You do not need to put a phone into the viewer. The right. computer and the screen and everything is built into the headset. Mm-hmm. And you access the Oculus store to go and find VR apps. So it's yeah. got like a hand controller. It's got a headset with lenses and everything in there. And it's... It's a comparable experience to the HTC Vive. It's not quite as sharp or quite, immersive. Yeah, right. It's not quite the same, but then it doesn't right. cost the same amount of money. No. I mean, the Vive itself will cost $600, and then you need like a gaming PC in yeah. order to run all the stuff. Green screen. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do the real bells and whistles of how sure. people see what you're involved in, you need a green screen. And, and so yeah. this thing is, is like $200, and we right. got one here at Grant Wood, and we've been exploring and trying mm-hmm. some things out. You tried yeah. some, yeah. and I tried some, yep. and it's pretty pretty darn good for what it is it's pretty decent yeah Yeah. so we're maybe have some news and follow up on that one as well later when we explore it i mean the only problem i'm finding so far is there's a lot of inappropriate content in there i totally was doing like walking dead the other day yeah i mean there's horror stuff on there there's like stuff that you you don't Mm -hmm. want kids really being exposed to or at least showing hey look at this technology it's great for yeah that kind of stuff so Is there a way to filter that stuff out? Yeah. Is there a way to put parental controls? Is there a way just to show the stuff that you want to see? I don't know if that's there yet, but hopefully it will come soon. All right. So I think that's about all we have time for this week. Big thank you to our friend Gina Rogers thank for you, helping Gina. us out on the cheating podcast. Well, thanks for having me. But <laughs> I think you guys did most of the... I just... No. You know. Well, offered a, a few thoughts. It's another one of these topics that we have off air and we had to like stop ourselves and say, no, we should do this on the podcast. Yeah, and right. then, so yeah, we had this conversation before, but mm-hmm. uh, it's good to get some of that stuff out in the open. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Thomas Hammerland, who's been nice enough to share our podcast on Twitter a few times now. Thomas is one of our international listeners, oh. Mindy, because he teaches in Japan. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. You can find Thanks him on Twitter at T Hammerland. I am at Team Carney on Twitter, and Jonathan is at Jonathan Wiley. Gina is at Gina G. G. G Rogers, Rogers 1010. 10. Um, our team account is at DLGWAEA, and you can also use our hashtag EdTechTakeout to tag the show. If you prefer, you can send us an email to podcast at GWAEA.org. And if you have any follow-up on the cheating hmm. ideas, then send those to Gina Rogers at yeah. G Rogers 1010. <laughs> <laughs> so until next time this has been the EdTech Takeout we hope it hit the spot for more information on today's episode please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast Okay, <laughs> now we have to take that part out, Gina Rogers. There's a lot of stuff to take out. Uh, uh, this is a long podcast. We're already over an hour, but well, we screwed around a lot. Yeah, we did.